Hello class. This uh, video is for painting assignment number four. We're going to be going over painting assignment number four. I'll be giving you instructions for that painting assignment. <clears throat> and we're going to start out by taking a look at my setup here, my, my still life setup. This is the uh, example that I'm giving you. <clears throat> As you can see, it is similar to the previous setup. I've made a few changes. I've included uh, another ship. We've got the Millennium Falcon in there and I've used smaller versions of TIE Fighters and an X-Wing Fighter. So I'm playing around with scale a little bit here. And <clears throat> as you recall, I mentioned in the last video, uh, painting assignment number three, uh, what we were doing is a series. We're doing a short series, two paintings that are related to each other. So whatever your 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 choice of subject matter was, your, your, your still life setup was for painting number three, you can make a few changes. Uh, minimum five objects, okay? That was the stated minimum for painting number three. For painting number four, still a minimum of five objects. Uh, I've exceeded that here. And you, you can change the composition slightly, okay? We want these paintings to be uh, in relation to each other as far as subject matter and content is concerned. Now, in this painting, we're going to be dealing with analogous color. Last time for painting number three, uh, we were dealing with complementary color. You chose a complementary color pair. You could create neutral tones using that complementary color pair as well as using the two colors. You, I introduced to you the concept of the split complementary uh, relationship where you incorporated two tertiary colors as well. Two tertiaries off the secondary, make neutral tones there. Plus you can make tints of all of that color. So you basically have two colors plus white <clears throat> and you can create a wide range of color uh, using using the complementary system and of course you get good uh, color contrast that way and I showed you that in the last uh, update video where I was using blue and orange in one painting and red and green in another well this time we're going to deal with analogous color analogous color refers to colors that are like each other that's what analogous means things are like each other they are alike they're similar and the exercise which correlates to this painting assignment uh, also covers analogous color. Exercise number four. Remember that? I've sent that information out as well. and Some of you have already been sending me uh, your submissions for that. So let's pan over and we're going to look at exercise number four. I've got it set up here. I'm going to need to zoom out a little bit. Let's go. There we go. There's exercise number four. Excuse me while I adjust the camera angle. This is not a very cooperative system I've got here. Okay, let me see if I can get this a little bit better shot. I apologize for my technical clumsiness. We work with what we have, okay? Okay, so there's <clears throat> exercise number four, all right? Analogous color groups, and they're all lined up. Red to violet, violet to blue, blue to green, green to yellow, <clears throat> yellow to orange, orange to red. <clears throat> what you're going to do for your color scheme, okay? The color scheme for painting assignment number four, you're going to select two related they have to be related, analogous color groups. Now let me explain what that means. Example, red to violet is one analogous color group. Okay, you've got red, 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 violet, red, violet, red, violet, violet, and then violet. Okay, see all that? That's one, two, three, four, five colors. That constitutes an analogous color group. You've got a primary, which is the red, a secondary, which is the violet, and then one, two, three tertiary colors, okay? 
Red, violet, violet, red, violet, red, red, violet. Next in line, violet, right? And then you have blue, violet, violet, blue, violet, blue, blue, violet, and blue. That constitutes another analogous color group. Both of these, both of these color groups, both of these analogous color groups are related to each other. You've got red on one side, blue on the other, and all these different violets in between, okay? Plus, there's all these tints, remember? Uh, make sure you make your tints on the exercise, folks. Some of you forget that. Uh, anyway, you can make a whole range of tints from each of these colors. That's my color scheme, okay? I'm choosing red to violet, violet to blue. That's the color scheme I'm working with. Another way to go. Okay, if I start at the violet, let's point to it, there it is. If I start at the violet and come down to red, right, I've got those five colors, and then jump over to the other side here, red to orange. Red, 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 orange, red, orange, red, orange, orange, orange. Okay, if I compare both of these columns what do they have in common? What they have in common is red. So that's another way to go. This is just an example, folks. Okay, it's an example. If I were to choose from red to violet, and then, or rather violet, starting at violet, violet to red, and then red to orange, that's an example of two analogous color groups that are related, and what they have in common is red. Okay, so in one paradigm, I'm working with blue and red at either extreme, and then all these different types of violets. In the other paradigm, I'm working with red, all right? And on one side of red, you go off to violet, and on the other side of red, you go off to orange. Two, two related analogous color, color groups. This works all the way through uh, the system all the way through the chart and that's one of the reasons I have you do this chart is because it can serve as a reference so you can see how the groups are related to each other okay another possibility starting down here with violet working up to blue and then from blue to green all right what do all these colors have in common blue all right or let's say I went from blue to green and then green to yellow what do all these colors have in common? Blue and yellow, all right? So there's a way to create a fairly broad range of color, but we want all of the color that you use to be related. So again, for the color scheme, choose two related analogous color groups, plus you get to make tints. See all the little tints here on the side? you get to make tents. You get to make as many tents as you can possibly make, all right? Now, as part of the demonstration, part of the video, I'm going to actually show you how this works. Uh, I've got two demonstration paintings, one that is just in the sketch stage and another where I've already blocked it out. So I'm going to start with the sketch and you'll be able to see You'll be able to see me uh, block it out, block it in rather. And then I'll show you the other painting I've got going and we'll develop it as well. Okay, so I want to do this in stages. So there's my, there's my sketch, there's my drawing. Okay, I'm using the paint. Draw with the paint. Okay, pick a dark color. All right, and draw with the paint. Lay out, your, lay out your composition that way. And then here's my palette. I don't know if you can see that in the shot. A little bit, huh? And I'm gonna add a little more paint to it. We're working with blue and red and violets. I'll have blue violets, I'll have red violets, okay? So that's my uh, two analogous color groups. Right, we're using violet, and I'll have 
blue violets and red violets, and on either extreme, I've got red and blue. Now, I'm going to set this up like we always do. Well, remember the rules of thumb? We work from dark to light, okay? Work from dark to light. So I'm going to set up where my darks are, and I'm going to start moving into some of my middle values. Okay, just like we also work general to specific, right? I'm going to generalize things for a bit. And when we say generalize, that means, you know, just I'm not going to get detailed. I'm not going to get overly detailed too soon. I'm just going to block things in. I'm choosing my brush here. Hold on. I want to use a large flat just to get this going and my oil let me find my oil there it is okay also on my palette over here I've got white I know you can't see this but I'll just tell you there's white right there there's blue right there and there's red right there and I'm going to make a violet in between the blue and the red and then I've got the rest of the palette to mix up red violets and blue violets and etc 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 for now though i'm going to make a violet and remember we're using cadmium red and ultramarine blue and that gives us a violet that's a, more of a burgundy type color at least on the palette it reads that way see and then i'm going to make a blue violet a blue blue violet actually and that's going to be my darkest dark Okay, and there are areas of the painting or the composition where I need something very dark. Okay, and you'll let me show you that. Let me block this in here. I've already mapped it off using a line. Look at that a blue, blue violet. The blue by itself, while still being very cool, is not necessarily all that dark. Okay. Ultramarine blue tends to be a bit translucent, as we've discussed before. So when I make a blue-blue violet, I am actually getting a very dark color. Now, we're not using neutral tones for this painting, okay? So we've got to create our value contrasts uh, using color contrast. We can, however, use tints, okay? But I want to hold off on that in this initial stage of the painting. I'm gonna to try to do as much as I can do with color, with dark values of color before I get into using tints. I'm gonna get into tints pretty quick, but still I wanna get as much done as I can with just using the darker value color. Remember, I'm just blocking it in. I'm just blocking it in. We're gonna layer this up, okay? Now, there's my darks. I've already laid in a few cast shadows, okay? Got some good values going on here at the bottom of this shot glass. By the way, that's a shot glass. My missus went to a bridal shower a few years back one of her friends was having a bridal shower getting married obviously and the party favor the takeaway the souvenir was a shot glass <laughs> what kind of bridal shower was that anyway so i'm using the shot glass to hold up this globe it's a globe by the way the sphere and one of the reasons I'm doing that is because I needed something to hold up the globe, right? I wanted something that was transparent, and I was very interested in the way uh, color and light were reflected off of the glass. So it all worked out well. Okay. Now, where's my rag? So that's the darks, and you can see I'm moving into some warmer values there. Now I'm going to shift into some blue, 
I'm going to take a violet. I'm going to take a little bit of white and I'm going to mix up a tint of a blue violet. And what that gives me on the palette is a rather blue gray color. Look at that. See that? See that? A blue violet with a tint on it and I get a good gray. I get a I get a dark gray. It's a dark gray value. And again, we're working from dark to light. So set it up. We're setting up our values. You're going to watch me paint in this video. But I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Okay, I want to block in the background. Another rule of thumb, I haven't given you this one. I've given you the three other three rules of thumb. Lean to fat, that is to say your painting, uh, the, the paint consistency starts off with a lot of solvent and then you get more oil into it as you go. Uh, dark to light, that's really, really helpful. If you set up your darks, when you put your lights on later, you don't have to work quite as hard. And they, it works quite well to do it that way. General to specific, we don't get into tight little specific relationships to start with. We generalize, get the paint on the canvas, and then we can start making smaller relationships, more specific relationships. We get into the details, the nuts and bolts, right? But you start out with just a general placement of where certain colors go. Another rule of thumb, a fourth rule of thumb, if you will, work from the background to the foreground. We start out by blocking in the background and then we can begin to develop things in the middle ground and things in the foreground. Okay, what I wanna do for the globe here, for this planet, is I'm going to make a red violet. I'm doing that on my palette. Actually, that's a red, red violet. And then I'm going to add I'm going to add some white to it. I'm going to make a tint, okay? Now the white, tinting the color, will enable me to take a rather limited palette and expand it, okay? You can use the tints to expand the color. That's a little too much. Boy, it doesn't take much white to bleed it all out. There we go, that's better. Okay, I reasserted the, the red-violet. There we go. I didn't want it too light to start with. Look at that. I'm setting up the underpainting, okay? I'll show you in my other uh, demo painting. So I want to get this demo painting roughly to the stage of where that other demo painting is at, and then I'm going to show you where to take it next, okay? Right? Now I'm going to get this a little pinker, a little more red, a hot violet tint, and we're going to lay on the ground plane. Now what I was starting to say uh, about blocking things in, about setting up the underpainting, is in the underpainting, all of my values are going to be dark okay even this even this tint of uh red violet red red violet it's still fairly dark relatively speaking that's fine that's what you want to do what you're trying to do is set things up so that later in the painting, you can introduce your lightest values, lighter values, I should say, your middle values going into your light values. And they sit on top of the underpainting 
and suddenly you see form and space emerge, okay? So set things up for yourself. See the painting you want to make in your mind and then deconstruct it in your mind, all right? Now, there's a setup, all right? I've got the background set up. I've got the uh, sphere, the globe set up. I've set up the ground plane. Let me do a quick setup for, let's, let's, let's pick the Millennium Falcon right there. We'll do a setup for that. I'm going to take a blue violet and I'm going to make a pretty high key tint. Not real high, but pretty high. I'm going to add just enough red so that I get a good, I get a good gray out of it. It's a blue violet gray. There we go. That looks good. You can't see it on my palette, but I'm looking at it and it looks all right. Now look at there. I'm just blocking this in. Okay, that's all I'm doing. Blocking it in, blocking it in, blocking it in. I can come back later and develop this further. I can get in some of the darker areas. I'll just paint those in right now. Just indicate. All I'm doing with this underpainting is indicating where certain features are. And then I can come back in with lighter values and even darker values where needed, warmer values, cooler values, whatever the case may be, and develop this further. But look, it's blocked in, right? And it's different from the ground plane. It's different from the background. It's different from the uh, sphere. Let's do one more. One more, and then I'm gonna move on to the other demo painting so you can see me take it a little further. Let's do a pink, right? Not only do we get to use all those violets, blue violets and red violets, we can also use red. We can also use blue. Those will get introduced later in the painting, right? I'm gonna to try to hold off on using true color until much later in the painting. I'm gonna do as much as I can with my blue violets and my red violets and all the tints of that color. And then later in the painting, I'll introduce a little bit of true color so it acts as an accent. Now what I'm doing is I'm painting this Star Destroyer pink. A pink Star Destroyer. Ooh. Well, relative to this color scheme, it'll work out pretty good. What I'm trying to do is set up a value contrast so that there's a clear difference between the ship, the model, ship model, and the surrounding uh, space. There's a difference between the ship model and the sphere. Let me get in a, some cast shadows going in there. I'm just introducing a blue violet on top of... Now see what I'm doing right there? I'm painting wet on wet, and I'm actually able to create the value that I should have put on to start with, right? You can do that. If the paint's wet, you can actually, and you know this already, but if the paint's wet, you can paint wet on wet and create a, a third value. Okay, uh, so what I, was, what I was talking about was the ship. I'm trying to set it up, set up the underpainting so that I get a good contrasting relationship between the form and the space. And I also want a contrasting relationship between this form to that form, this form to that form, okay? We wanna set up these differences so that, you know, they, they read. Contrast, all right? Our color, our analogous color, you're using colors that are all related. We're not having the strong color contrast that you would have in a uh, complementary color situation. But what you can do is set up strong value contrasts. You can set them up so strongly that they start to look like color contrasts. They're not really, but they can look that way. They, they can fool the eye, you'll read them as being color contrasts, even though they're not necessarily color contrasts. And the result is, you know, you have a 
whole range of color that is related and then you get interesting value contrasts. Okay, so that's blocking it in. The next thing I would do would be the X-Wing and the TIE Fighters, but that's pretty small stuff. I'm not gonna make you watch me do that right now. I am, however, going to get this previously blocked in painting through the magic of television. Ooh, there we go. And it's similar in, in, in its stage, in its setup to the other one. And now you do get to watch me paint some smaller stuff. You get the painting blocked in, where do you take it from there? What do we do next? How do we, how do we proceed, Mr. Lyles? Well, let's go. First I'm gonna do is catch up this one a little bit. That's the wrong paintbrush. I've lost my paintbrush. There it is, okay. First thing I'm gonna do I'm going to catch this up a bit. I got a little further in the last one than I did in this one. So let's block in the Millennium Falcon again. Blue violet, high key tint, just enough red, just a touch of red so that it grays out really nicely. There we go. Perfect. Blocking in the Millennium Falcon. Great shot, kid. That's one in a million. Don't get cocky. I'm quoting Han Solo. My apologies. Gen Xers grew up on Star Wars. Can't help it. Okay. Block that in. Now let's block in the Star Destroyer. Mr. Lyles, I don't care anything about Star Wars. Shame on you! No, that's okay. Uh, I'm using a science fiction theme for these demo paintings that I've done, these four still life paintings that I've done throughout the semester. Give yourself a theme. What are you trying to say? What do you want to say? What are you interested in? Okay? Remember, a still life painting has a narrative potential. Okay? It is possible to communicate ideas and story ideas or conceptual ideas through the selection of objects, all right? That's one of the powers or virtues of still life painting. And I'm not just making that up. There's a long tradition of that in European painting, okay? Where the artist is making a statement about something and using the objects that they're referencing as the context for what they're saying. Okay, so I'm just blocking this out here. Mm, yeah, that should be longer. Let's do that. All right, so that catches me up. I'm roughly at the position I was in the last painting. Let's get a little more detail. Oop, I bumped my, I bumped my set up there. Let's get a little more detail. I want to make a good dark blue blue violet and I'm going to I'm going to paint in my darks. Don't be afraid to get dark. Really set up the darks. Make them strong, strong, obnoxious, moody darks. Okay? How dark can you make it be? How dark can it be? Get it dark because we can always work up lighter, all right? We can always get it to go lighter. That's not a problem. The problem is trying to express contrasting values, okay? Everybody falls in love with all those beautiful middle tones and how well-modeled something is and, oh, that looks so nice. And then you step away from the painting and it's flat, and it's flat because you have not allowed for strong contrasting values. You, you, you've tried to, to control that too much. Let the darks be dark, okay? If it's dark, let it be dark. Block it in. Make it dark. Don't be afraid of the dark. Because 
pretty soon we're going to bring in some light okay now i'm going to focus on one of these tie fighters just so that you can see what i'm talking about all right I want to make a high key red violet, red, red violet with a little bit of white. And we're going to talk about the ground plane for a moment. When I say talk about, it means I'm putting a brush on the canvas and I'm putting color on the painting. We're going to talk about the ground plane for a moment. And I'm going to use this color to frame where the wing of this TIE fighter is, the solar panel. It's one of the ways they're supposed to power themselves is by collecting solar energy. Even the empire was going green. Okay, now I'm mixing up a very cool middle gray. It's actually a violet, but it's got it's got enough white in it and just enough red so that it reads as a cool gray. And I'm going to block in this X-Wing, not X-Wing, I'm sorry. Shame on you, Lyles. TIE Fighter. And it's actually, to be specific, it's actually a first order TIE Fighter. <gasps> okay. The millennial version of Star Wars. Don't get me started. Okay, here we go. Now I'm going to reassert the color that I'm using for the ground plane. I'm going to make a dark cool gray. And I'm going to use that for the body of the TIE Fighter. And then we're going to get back into this light, cool gray. And I'm going to paint in the other solar panel. Now, can you see what I'm not doing? What am I not doing? I'm not being fussy. I'm not being overly detailed. I'm still generalizing I'm just generalizing at a smaller scale. This allows me to get the paint on the canvas to make reference to where the object is or is going to be, and I can refine it as I go, okay? Remember, your painting is not a colored drawing. This is not about trying to draw it all out perfectly and then color it in. No, we're using color and value to build up form. It takes a minute to do it. It takes, it takes a little time. You've got to spend time with it. And you've got to set up the underpainting. Okay, and when you do that, you will find that as you refine the form further, suddenly it just falls in place. It's like, oh, how did I paint that? That's so beautiful. Oh, Mr. Lyles, you're such a wonderful painting teacher. Yeah, I am. How about that? Okay, so there, I've got the basics of that TIE Fighter, and I can refine it from there. Now, let me do one other thing here. I'm going to go back to the ground plane, and I'm going to paint in the ground plane. Remember, the space can help define the form. I'm using the space that the object occupies to help define the object, the edge of the object. And I'm going to make a warm violet, a warm dark violet, maybe a little warmer. When I say warmer, it means I'm just adding red, and that's going to be where my cast shadow is. Boom. There. Okay? Or part of my cast shadow. There's another part of the cast shadow right here. Boom. There it is. Boom, there it is. Okay. Okay. Let's get this. Yeah, too much white. Too much white. I blew it. Okay. 
let's fix it dark blue blue violet blue blue violet you can always get it lighter folks set up your darks okay you see you see now this tie fighter is roughly at the same stage as our millennium falcon over here and i can come back in and using various degrees of tint i can lighten up some of the stuff happening on our millennium falcon Mm-hmm. Okay. And it can get just as detailed as I want to make it. All right. Once you understand this principle of general to specific, the image can get just as detailed as you want it to be. All right. But I also then have the option of keeping some of these faster marks. One of the reasons that I push this general to specific as a means of approaching the painting is because there's stuff happening with all of these gestural marks, all of these layout marks. There's some high energy marks happening here. That's good stuff, okay? Not every single square inch of the painting has to be handled the exact same way. That's not always interesting. I can pick and choose where I want the viewer's eye to spend time and to focus and where I want the viewer's eye to move through quickly, okay? So think it through. What are you trying to say? What, is, what do you want your viewer to see first? When do you want your viewer to see it? And how long do you want them to focus on it? All right, these are things to consider. Yes, there is a technical reason, a practical reason for doing general to specific. You got to get the paint on the canvas before you can do anything with it. You got to push it around, okay? But there's also a conceptual side. What are you trying to say? What's important? What do you want your viewer to see? When do you want them to see it? How do you want them to see it? And then where do you want them to go next? All right? Think it through, folks. You're not a Polaroid camera. If it was just a matter of making a pretty picture, then you whip out your cell phone and snap, you're done. It's not about that. Paint can do things that the camera doesn't do. Paint can communicate in ways that a camera doesn't communicate, okay? You can construct not only the image, but also the way in which the image is perceived. You, the artist, the painter, you construct that. I won't say photography doesn't do that. It does it in a different way, okay? That would be the more accurate way to express that. Photography just does these things in a different way. Painting for the painter, it forces you to think about things like content and subject matter and how an image is read. It forces you to think that through uh, at a different speed. Okay. Now let's jump up here to this. Look at that. I'm introducing a pink and suddenly now, you know, we're dealing with uh, uh, a different type of relationship on our planet here. Light's hitting it, isn't it? It's penetrating it in a different way. Surrounds us, penetrates us, binds the galaxy together. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, I'll stop. Right. Look at that. Okay, look what I did right there. Can you see it? No, you can't. Let me zoom this up. Okay, look, you see that? This violet, a rather warm violet underneath where shadow's hitting. And then I've got three different pinks. This one has got a little bit of blue in it. So it's actually a very, very, very warm violet with just a little bit of white, okay? And then this cool pink over here to the right and then a very high key pink true pink. I know the camera's jiggling. I'm sorry. I'm holding it uh, as a highlight. And suddenly we're talking about form. <laughs> okay, form. We use contrasting values to create form. Yes, we do. We understand that, don't we? Yes, Mr. Lyles, we understand. 
Okay, let me let go of the camera. It'll drop a little bit. So, this painting will just continue. I'll continue to uh, refine it, refine the image a bit by uh, refining the transitions in value. I'm playing with reds. I'm playing with pinks. I'm playing with violets. I'm playing with blues. I'm playing with tints of blues. All right, and I'm using all of that to create form and space and suggest a narrative, okay? Now, let's talk about some stuff for class for just a moment. Ugh, let me get off the floor here. <clears throat> this is painting assignment number four. Let me reiterate that. Number four, painting assignment number four. And in painting assignment number four, you're going to choose two analogous color groups, right? Remember the exercise? Yes, we know that exercise. We hate that exercise. We've been working on that exercise for 10 days now. Yeah, okay. That's your exercise, analogous color groups. Use the chart. Choose two, two related analogous color groups. Choose two, okay? And you also get to have tints. See the tint right there? All right, that's your color scheme. Two related analogous color groups, plus you get to use tints. Okay, it is Sunday the 14th when I am filming this, taping this, digitally recording this, and I will send this out Monday, probably Monday. I, I know it's spring break. It is spring break. Yes, I'm aware it's spring break. Guess what? I'm still going to send this to you. You'll still have it. I'll give you a deadline for it. Uh, I'm, I'm accommodating for spring break, so the deadline won't be like crazy, ridiculous, you know. Uh, I, I set deadlines for the other assignments relative to both spring break and the week we lost for the freeze. But we did lose a week for the freeze. So I'm trying to push us along. Painting number five, heads up, painting number five, okay, number five. Painting number five is going to be a landscape, all right, and I will send you more information about that. I'm working on a few ideas. Uh, painting number five, you're going to be responding to observed color. What are you talking about, Lyles? Okay, you go outside uh, and you look and you try to match the color that you see. And you'll have your, you know, a full range of color. You have your primaries, you'll have your secondaries, you'll have your tertiaries, you'll have tints, you can make neutral tones. We're still staying away from the earth tones right now. We'll bring them back in a little bit. Uh, but I want to give you the experience of a landscape painting. Um, yeah, I don't want to go much further into that. I, I'm, I'm going to I've got to make a few decisions about how we're going to proceed and then I'll be in contact with you. I'll send you an email and, and maybe do a, a little short demo video too. Uh, but we'll, I just want to give you a, a heads up. Painting number five, painting number five will be a landscape work from observation. Okay, but this, this, this is painting number four, painting assignment number four. And it is two related analogous color groups. One more time. Okay, there's your analogous assignment that was your exercise exercise assignment okay pick out two related analogous color groups that's your color scheme make a few changes in your setup remember it needs to be related to the setup from painting number three you have a series now okay a series you're creating paint images that are related to each other in both subject matter and and content perhaps so set it up all right, if you have any questions, email me. I'm going to be checking my email as often as I can through the spring break, which basically means at least once a day. Uh, I'm also gonna be catching up on my correspondence. Many of you have sent items in that I still need to review and get back to you about. I apologize for my tardiness on that. I will be getting caught up this week. So, barring any unforeseen circumstances. All right, stay safe, stay safe. All right, I know it's spring break and everybody wants to go party. Uh-uh, no, be safe, okay? Social distance, I know it's spring break. Social distance, are you kidding me? Yeah, absolutely, all right? Uh, 
COVID is still out there. And if we're not careful, we're going to see the numbers spike again. So be smart. Stay safe. All right. Wear your mask. Social distance. Okay. Stay home and paint. I mean, golly, you've got a week, right? Stay home and paint. What, what more could you want? Life's perfect. Anyway, um, stay tuned. Okay. Keep your, keep your eyes open for my emails and my, my videos. And there will be more to come. All right. Thank you much. Have a good week. We'll be talking to you soon. Bye-bye.